Well, welcome to you. We're going to come now to God's Word, the Bible. It is a strange thing for us to give our attention to such an ancient book that really hasn't had any new material added in 2,000 years. But that's because it's a living book. It is God's Word to us. And we're coming now to, uh, to look at it together. Uh, we're coming to a, a new series this morning, a small series in the tail end of the Gospel of John. Now, we spent six months in John's Gospel last year, and we got as far as chapter 16. And now we're going to be looking at chapter 17 through to 21 over these next couple of weeks. And it's really the, the most important period in Jesus' life and ministry. It's the climax of everything he came to do. And so do come along each week as we look at it together. Let me, uh, let me start start off by just finishing off that reading for us in chapter 17. So if you have a Bible, open it up uh, to the section that Andre read for us, and I'm going to pick it up at verse 13. Jesus says these words, I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you send them into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, Just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory the glory you have given me, because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. And though, that, uh, and, and though they know that you have sent me, sorry, <laughs> righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I, may, I myself may be in them. Well, it's quite a mouthful, but it's a profound passage. We're going to have a look at it together. Before we do so, let me pray, and then we'll, uh, we'll have a look at the, the text together. Let's pray. Lord, this morning our request is simple. It's, it's what we pray every time we come to you, that you would take your word, that you would open it up to us so that we might be able to see, as you've promised, the truth of who you are, uh, the wonder of who Jesus is, and what it means to know him and to follow him. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder if you've ever had a conversation with someone in the last moments of their life. I don't mean to be morbid, but it is a profound experience when that happens. Uh, When you know that time is short, you don't beat around the bush. Everything you say, every word that you speak is important. Uh, you, You only speak really about things that are truly on your heart. Well, in John chapter 17, we hear some of Jesus' last words spoken in the hearing of his disciples. And what makes these words even more incredible is that they come to us in the form of a prayer. And so this chapter is one long prayer that Jesus prays, and we get to listen in to what he says, which makes it one of the most profound chapters, as I say, in maybe the whole Bible. We get to hear God the Son praying to God the Father for us. Most of this prayer is really a prayer for us. It's incredible. Now, your Bible probably uh, divides this section very helpfully into three uh, distinct parts of the prayer. I'm going to zone in there on, on two main sections of the prayer. I'm going to put the, the second two sections under one heading because I think it divides nicely into these two sections, what Jesus prays for himself and what he prays for us. So let's firstly look at what Jesus prays for himself. The first five verses are Jesus' prayer for himself. And, and it's important to see what he prays for. What does he pray for? What would you pray for if you knew that in just a few hours you would face the torture of the cross? Well, Jesus prays for one main thing. He prays for God's glory. He prays for God's glory over and over again. That's the the idea and the theme that comes up in this prayer, that God would be glorified. Have a look at verse 1 with me. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and he prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. If you had to try and sum up this whole prayer, that is the word, glory. 
Now, glory is one of the hardest words to try and grasp. It's a bit like a, a bar of soap in the shower. You, you think you got it and it slips out of your hand and you think you've understood the term and then suddenly you've forgotten exactly what it means. And it's a very fuzzy term to try and understand. Glory simply means bigness. Bigness. I'm not sure if that's a word, but that's what it means. Greatness. And so when we talk of God's glory, we're talking about everything that makes God great. Uh, and so for Jesus here to pray for God's glory, he's praying that God would be seen to be as great as he really is. And so as Jesus prays for himself on the eve of his death, this is what's on his mind. This is what's most, this is what's uppermost in his heart. He wants to bring glory to his Father. How does he want to do that? Well, he wants to do it by finishing the job that the Father has sent him to do. The hour has come, Jesus says in verse 1. The hour has come. In other words, that moment that everything has been moving towards, the moment that in God's plans all of history have been moving towards has come. The moment for Jesus to face up to the, the reason for his coming. And so in just a couple of hours, Jesus is going to be arrested and then killed, executed brutally, and then before sunset the next morning, he'll be buried in a tomb in the side of a hill. Let me ask you again, what would you pray for? Jesus prays that what he's about to do will bring glory to his Father. That the Father's value and power and worth and majesty and greatness would be seen through what is about to happen in the next few hours. It would be visible for everyone to see. At the cross, you might ask? How could the brutal execution of a man like Jesus, a man as good as Jesus, in any way make God seem glorious? You know, realizing someone's greatness, his glory, usually involves witnessing something phenomenal that they do, maybe some great impressive skill. You know, I remember uh, a few years ago, I'd heard for many years about this incredible Australian guitarist named Tommy Emmanuel. Uh, everybody who plays guitar knows Tommy Emmanuel. I hadn't yet seen him play, but I'd heard about him. And then somebody lent me a DVD of him. And when I saw it firsthand, I witnessed his glory, as it were. You know, it should not be possible to do what Tommy Emmanuel does on the guitar. It's mind-blowing. So we might understand, you know, God's glory being seen in something big that he does, maybe, you know, coming at Mount Sinai or, or, or the powerful act of creation or some of what Jesus did in walking on the water or raising Lazarus back to life again. But what's so glorious about God letting his son be tortured and killed at the cross? Doesn't it actually make God look weak, like he's lost control, like his enemies have won? Jesus sees it very differently. Jesus sees what he is about to do by going to the cross willingly is that this will be the greatest display of God's glory in all of history. It'll be the most glorious thing God has ever done. Why is that? Well, it has to do with the reason Jesus came. Notice what Jesus says in verse 2. He says, For you granted him, that's Jesus, authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you had given him. Now, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Right there is the reason Jesus came and the reason he has to go to the cross. Jesus came to bring eternal life. Eternal life. Life that isn't destroyed by death. Life that is lived for the purpose that we were created. Notice, to know God. That's what eternal life is. It's a very interesting definition of what eternal life is. Eternal life isn't just life that doesn't end. It isn't just living forever. Eternal life is, the, the, the essence of it is living to know God forever. Living to know God as he really is, as our Father and living to know Jesus in all his glory for all eternity. That's why the death of Jesus is so glorious in our understanding of who God is. Because Jesus is coming to fix the world, and Jesus is putting on display all of God's plans and all of God's character in bringing that about. He's not dying as a criminal. He's not dying as a victim. He's dying willingly to fulfill God's eternal plan. So what does Jesus pray? He prays that God would give him the strength, that his Father would in, uh, empower him and strengthen him to carry that task out. And of course, with what is about to happen, Jesus needs that strength from the Father. I mean, we often think of the brutality of Jesus' execution at the cross, and certainly it was brutal. If you want to do a bit of research on that and what is involved, you will be left feeling nauseous by, by the sheer torture of what happens to Jesus physically. But of course, the weight that Jesus is about to carry is far greater than just the physical agony that he's about to experience. Jesus is going to be bearing the sin of the world. 
We don't even understand what that might mean. And so, yes, Jesus says, Lord, I want to glorify you. I want to glorify you, Father, but I need your help. I need your strength. And, of course, the Father answers that because even in Jesus' weakest moment, in a few hours as he prays in Gethsemane, that if there's any other way, Jesus says, not my will, but yours be done. And he goes to the cross. Without Jesus' prayer here, we don't know whether he would have had the strength to carry it out. Jesus goes to the cross and glorifies his Father and brings us eternal life because he prays that the Father would help him. So that's the first section of the prayer, Jesus praying for strength and for ultimate glory for his Father. The the, the majority of the prayer there is actually Jesus praying for us. So we're going to spend the rest of our time looking at the second part of the prayer from verse 6 onwards as Jesus prays for us. Now, it's important to understand that although he he prays for the disciples first and then us really a bit later on, he prays really the same thing. And so I'm going to look at them together under the same heading. And there are four parts to what he prays. And here's the thing. Everything he prays has to do still with God's glory. So firstly, Jesus prays for our mission. The key verse is in verse 18. Jesus says, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Just as he was sent into the world, now he is sending out initially his disciples, but uh, further to that, every single follower of Jesus into the world. And the the commission that he gives them is the same really as, as his mission into the world, and that is to proclaim the glory of God and the kingdom that God is bringing about, to declare the gospel. And so we have a job to do. Jesus has left us with a job to do, to go out into the world, to be sent out into the world to do this work. Now, Jesus could have done this on his own. God could have done this without our help, but he chooses to allow us to partner with him in this mission of proclaiming the kingdom of God and the gospel of God. That's our job. And really, the the only reason God hasn't ended history and Jesus hasn't returned is because this job is still outstanding. We still have this job to do. And so what the implication is for each of us is that whoever we are, Whatever our circumstances in life, whatever our resources, whatever our talents that we've been given by God, are to be employed for this mission. That's what God is expecting of us. I wonder if you see it that way. I wonder if you think of the rest of your life as being given to you by God to be employed in His mission. I read this uh, earlier today, in fact, of a man by the name of Edward Nelson. He died earlier in the week. Uh, He was a French-American. You probably never heard of him. I hadn't heard of him until today. Uh, He died at the age of 45 in a climbing accident. He left behind his family and his four kids. A brilliant man by all accounts. An Oxford graduate. And and when, when somebody I knew said that he was perhaps the greatest man he'd ever met, I had to find out more. And, and certainly, as you read about him, his character, his life, his decision-making, you realize what he meant. Here was a man with everything at his fingertips, an intelligent man, a brilliant man, but a man who chose to employ his life in the service of God and his kingdom, to employ himself on the mission that God has sent us on. And so he says this, he says, before he died, he said these words, he said, what can I, as the person I am and the gifts God has given me, do to best serve the kingdom of God? What can I, as the person I am and the gifts God has given me, do to best serve the kingdom of God? Edward Nelson decided to give up everything and to become a pastor and a church planter in secular France. What are you going to do on that mission? See, that's the question, isn't it? Jesus says we are to be on mission for him. And he says, I'm going to pray that that happens. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending them. Now, as Jesus prays, he he doesn't leave us alone. He equips us in that task through his prayer. And so he prays in verse 17 that God the Father would sanctify us for the task. Notice verse 17. He says to his Father in heaven, sanctify them, sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. In this mission, the thing that we have, the manual that we have to live by and to carry out the mission is God's truth, God's word. And so God's word is what sanctifies us, sets us apart for this task that God has called us to do. So Jesus prays for our mission. Secondly, and this leads to a second request that is equally important if we're going to do the mission, Jesus prays for our protection. Look at verse 11. Jesus says, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. 
and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name. Verse 12, while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe. See, the disciples had Jesus side by side with them for the past three years. Uh, he was always there to take control of the situation, uh, to, to help them along in each of the circumstances they faced. Uh, he was there to point out their mistakes, to correct their thinking. He had the kind of authority over people and over evil and over death, uh, even over creation itself, that helped them to feel always secure, always safe, that things were never completely out of hand when Jesus was around. But now Jesus says his time on earth is almost up. And so he hands over the baton to us and he wants us to run. And what he realizes is that as we go about this task, the world is not going to be friendly towards us. Verse 14, he says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them. That's a really strong word, isn't it? For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. See, the world hates those who follow Jesus. There's no way to beat around this. This is the fact. As Christians go out into the world as followers of Jesus, the world hates them. Because Jesus is too demanding and he's too exclusive for people to stomach. And so we're an offense to the world. And, and let me say it's getting harder and harder to be a follower of Jesus in the world. And I expect that to continue. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if some of our church end up in prison over the next generation simply for following Jesus and holding to him. I mean, that's the kind of, uh, of opposition that is slowly rising in our culture and in our world. And Jesus prays for our protection. Now, what we've got to realize here is he's not, pr he's not praying that God would keep us from harm, physically, necessarily, or keep us out of jail, uh, or keep us from getting an attacked or antagonized. He's really talking about spiritual harm, which is far more se uh, serious and far more significant. And, and what he goes on to pray, and this sort of reveals what he's talking about here, is he prays against the one, uh, for safety against the one who really stands behind the opposition from the world. Verse 15. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world. There it is. He's not praying that God would remove us, but that you would protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. As we go about this mission for God's glory, we need the protection from Satan. Because Satan's great aim in this world is to derail the Christian faith and to, to uh, make the life of those who try to live for this mission as difficult as possible. And in the process, what sometimes happens is people's spiritual uh, walk, their faith, gets derailed. It gets attacked. They're left without a faith, perhaps, uh, even though they once thought that they had a faith. See, being on mission for Jesus is a very dangerous thing. And Jesus knows that there are going to be many temptations on the way to give up. But I want to tell you this morning that Jesus has prayed for you. Jesus has prayed for me in this mission. I think that's the most incredible thing. That as we go on through the Christian life, as Satan puts his target on us, there's nothing that he can do ultimately for those who have really trusted in Jesus because Jesus has prayed for us. And how do we know his prayer works? Well, as we turn to the very last book of the Bible, we see that every single one of those entrusted to Jesus makes it to the end. So Jesus prays for our protection. Thirdly, Jesus prays, and this might be a bit of a, a surprise to you, Jesus prays for our unity. He prays for our unity. As he thinks about God's glory, Jesus thinks that our unity together is critical. Let me read from verse 20. Jesus says, My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. I wonder if it surprises you how much this means to Jesus, that his people are unified you know, I recently had my eyes open to just how much of the New Testament speaks about unity. In almost every single New Testament letter, there is this, this huge theme that runs through it of unity, whether it's racial unity or ethnic unity or relational unity. It's everywhere. This matters to God far more than we realize. So much so that it dominates the second part of this prayer of Jesus uh, here in chapter 17. Now the question is, why is unity so important to God? And it matters because of God's glory. Again, God's glory is uppermost here. God wants his people to reflect what he is like to the world. God is three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, but they are perfectly united in love. 
And here Jesus prays that we will be united like that as a mirror to display what God is like. Verse 21, he prays that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. See the the reason there? He prays for unity so that we would be like God, unified together. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Here it is. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you love me. Do you see how it works? We are united to Christ by faith when we come to him. And then he unites us to one another at the same time so that in some way we are able to display something of what God is like to the world. And it glorifies him. And it has an impact. You know, there was a, a, a Greek writer in the early second century and, uh, and he saw the unity of the early Christians and it blew him away. His name was Lucian. Here's what he wrote. He said, It is incredible to see the eagerness with which the people of that religion, Christianity, help each other in their needs. They spare nothing. Jesus has put it into their heads that they are all brothers. In other words, he saw how they loved one another in unity and he couldn't understand it. Because in a world divided by everything, by race and gender and age and social class and the rugby team you support and the music you like, you name it, we found a way to divide over it. When people like the church come together in spite of their differences and love one another in a way that overcomes their differences, overlooks their differences, that speaks volumes for the gospel. And so Jesus prays that we would be unified. It's critical to our mission, and it's critical to God's glory. Jesus prays for our mission. He prays for our protection. He prays for our unity. And then most amazing of all, and I'll be quick here, Jesus prays for our glory. Our glory. He's prayed for his Father's glory. Now he prays for our glory. Have a look at verse 24. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. What is going to bring God glory in terms of us as we live by faith is when we are are brought to the end and we ourselves experience that glory that the Father and Son have experienced for all eternity. And so Jesus prays that the Father would do everything necessary to bring us home. And again, we know that that prayer answered because we see at the end of the book that we make it, that none of those entrusted by the Father to the Son has been lost along the way. You know, if you've put your trust in Jesus, you are safe in his hands. You're safe in his hands. And the reason you're safe in his hands is not because you have the strength and you have the courage and you have the tenacity to keep going. It's because Jesus prayed for you. In the last moments, as uh, Jesus speaks to his disciples on this occasion, we get to see something of his heart. We get to see something of his, his, uh, his passion and his all-encompassing desire to see God glorified. But I want to point out one last thing, one last clue as to why he prays this and why he allows us to hear him praying it. And it's in verse 13, and I think this is incredible. Verse 13, Jesus says, Father, I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Yes, this is all for God's glory, but it's also for our joy. Jesus wants us to experience the joy that he intends for us. How do we get that? We live for God's glory. The more God's glory is the center of our life, the more we will experience the joy that is meant for us. So these should be our prayers too, don't you think? As we pray for one another, as we pray for our church, let's pray these things because they certainly matter to Jesus. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you that we have this incredible privilege of hearing, listening in to Jesus as he prays for himself, but also for us. Lord, we pray the same prayers that he prayed. We pray for our mission. Help us to always be mindful of the kingdom work that is in front of us. Lord, we pray for our protection, that along the way we would not be lost, that Satan would not have his way and would not derail our faith. Lord, we pray that in the process we would be unified that we would let nothing of consequence separate us from one another. 
And Lord, that we would look forward to that day when we will come home and experience the glory that Jesus describes here. And Lord, protect us as we head towards that day. We thank you for this passage. We thank you for Jesus. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Friends, I hope it's been an encouragement to you. Uh, come along to our growth groups this week as we look more at this passage. There's so much more to dig into here. Uh, you can pick up one of the, uh, the growth group uh, guides from our website. Otherwise, stick around now. We're going to sing a couple of songs.